of this week's confessions. The first one uh, comes from Laura, who sent a confession to Confessions... Uh, oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, confessions <laughs> at greatestitsradio.co.uk. I mean, clearly you finished, so just okay. we move on. Uh, so we have uh, Sister Katie Susie, we have uh, mm-hmm. Brother Matthew all sitting in judgment on Laura, who sends in today's tale. Father Simon and the Holy Collective, as the weather improves and thoughts turn to maybe finally being able to take a holiday abroad, mm-hmm. I wish to confess to a holiday incident that occurred ten years ago when my daughter was seven and my son was ten. We'd been on a lovely holiday to Menorca, where the sun had shone and we had made many happy holiday memories. The only fly in the ointment, as it were, was an issue with our flights. Wanting to keep the cost of our family holiday down, we chose to fly with a budget airline who were not well known for their quality customer services. Okay. Sit there, shut up, stop talking. A sandwich, 20 pounds. (laughs) Right. You get get my drift. We refused to pay extra for pre-booked seats. And on the flight out, our crew tried to insist that my seven-year-old daughter sat on her own at the back of the plane as there were no seats together. It took a standoff. We were literally refusing to sit down by myself, my husband and my son before a solution could be found. Concerned about a repeat of this on our way home, we ensured we arrived extra early at the airport. So we were near the front of the queue to board. The flight was a bit delayed. And it was very tedious to just have to stand around and wait, but we did. Bored by waiting so long, I started to listen to the couple who were in front of us in the queue. They were going on and on about the awful holiday they'd just had, complaining about elderly relatives, Bob and June. It'd been like a couple of potatoes, walking slowly everywhere they went and dragging the mood of the holiday down. Miserable faces, they said. Boring company, they said. Never paid for anything either, they said. They vowed never to come away again with these people, these family members ever again. Suddenly the gate opened and the queue began to move. From nowhere appeared about 17 relatives of the couple in front of us. There were aunties and uncles, grandma and granddad and an assortment of other relatives. They appeared to think that a place in the queue had been saved for them. At this point, I saw red. If all those people jumped the queue, we would be back in the situation we had on our outward flight. So I stepped up and very loudly and to the utter mortification of my family said, I'm sorry, there's a queue here and you need to join the back of it. Over there, yes, you see the back of the queue, that's where you're going. Well, as you can imagine, this did not go down well. One woman, I think the mother, said it was fine as a place was being saved in the queue for all of them by the couple in front of us. Oh, really, I said, and then went on to tell them exactly what this couple had been saying about them. (laughs) Where are Bob and June, then? Oh, right. Well, you should know that they hated being on holiday with you. Walking around with you was apparently like walking around with a sack of potatoes. They said you were miserable company, boring people, and mean with it and never bought a thing. Well, as you can imagine, this caused a mighty row to break out within the family, and they stepped out of the queue to shout at each other. (laughs) Job done, and we got our seats on the plane together. Smart thinking, huh? Anyway, says Laura... I seek forgiveness not from the awful cute jumping family. They deserve what happened. But from my husband, my son and daughter. (laughs) Who to this day still get nervous if we're in a queue. (laughs) And it looks like someone is going to push in. Mm. I have assured Um. them that this was a one-off. But forgiveness from yourselves and your listeners might help them truly believe me. I'm not quite convinced it's a one-off, because if you've done that sort of thing before, and you've seen how it works, then maybe you're going to try it again. Anyway, my guess is that Laura is going to get a lot of public understanding and public forgiveness, but we'll find out. First of all, our producer and sister, Katie, is going to speak uh, with a voice of moral authority. Thank you. Um, I mean, I have no time for queue jumpers. Obviously, we're, we're British. I love a queue. I respect that. But... My issue is, in order to avoid that, you could have paid extra to pre-book. Like, you could have... There was another way to ensure that you had the seat. Why should you do that? Well, otherwise you've caused an argument with a family that you just didn't need to do. You kind of meddled in their Mm -hmm. business. Gives me the same same energy as people that are always standing up to be the first off the flight, and they really stress me out. So I'm sorry, (laughs) Laura, you're not forgiven. Okay, all right. Well, some harsh words there. Uh, Brother from another gunner? I definitely... Signed and sealed, I am forgiving here. And I don't think any right 
minded person <laughs> is going to disagree with us. <laughs> definitely, definitely forgiven. Oh, the things I've thought about people who queue jump in front of me. It's far worse than what Laura's done here. Absolutely forgiven. Uh, the family added, they're all coming to them. Unlucky sunshine. Not having two, two people do not save the place for 17. No. That's the rule. I think it is. The, I, th- I think most people go, if you let one person in, find two people. Mm, but 17, it. 17, no I don't think so. No. Anyway, we'll find out, won't we? The people's verdict, please. Do you forgive Laura for her cue jumping story? Uh, on the text, 61054. Start your message with Simon. Or you can email simon at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. It's nine minutes past six. This is Drive Time. This is Greatest Hits Radio here till seven o'clock. Then it's Jackie Brambles. Tonight's confession came from Laura. Uh, a torrid tale of queuing in Menorca, uh, trying to avoid the problem that she'd had on the flight out with her family where no one could get proper seats. They'd arrived early. Then two people uh, arrived, started bad-mouthing all the people they'd been on holiday with, who then tried to join the queue, about 17 mm. of them. Laura was having none of it uh, and explained what the two people there had actually thought about their holiday with their vast family. Uh, the people's verdict is in. Here it comes. Now, now I said everyone would, would forgive. Not so. Oh. Jack, not forgiven. While I have sympathy for Laura, just pay the extra and then you can all sit together. You could have avoided all of this. However, Drick says, oh, Laura, I forgive you. I have done the same or similar, much to my husband and daughter's horror. Being South African, we don't do cues well and as for queue jumpers, not acceptable. And Andy says, absolutely forgiven. What I don't forgive, however, is that this took place without me there as a witness of the entertainment. So, uh, I think this makes me think of airport confessions. Yes. Uh, queuing Definitely queues, yes. Going on holiday with extended family, I don't yes. know. Maybe People being that, potatoes. People being yes. potatoes. I- indeed. <laughs> yes. uh, and being stingy. <laughs> if you have a tale for us, we'd love to hear it. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. If we use yours, you get a smart speaker. Laura has won the first of the week. Maybe it'll be you tomorrow. If you have a tale, confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. It's 5.46. And it's time to hand out another smart speaker because when I say hand out, we're not just giving them away. You have to earn it by coming up well, not by playing that jingle we don't no Matt will you get this right for heaven's sake there it is very straightforward I mean they are a winner it was kind of there is, there, there yeah, is. Winning it's true. Well. so many great features I just don't know which thing to hit the well most well rescued yeah. thank you uh, tonight's confession comes from Marty Marty gets the smart speaker um, I think just checking in I think it's a 12 yeah I would say a 12 I think so. Ooh. Mm, I think so. I like. Marty says, uh, Simon and the Conviction Crew, I've held on to this confession for over 20 years now. It's time to let it go. We go back to the late 90s, and I'm just about to start my GCSEs at secondary school. After ridiculing my friends for all having part-time jobs, but then seeing them have nice things like driving lessons and CD Walkmans, I decided to take the plunge to being an adult and getting my first part-time job. My ambition was to work in a medical setting, maybe a doctor or a paramedic. But nothing on a 16-year-old job offerings list was close until my sister suggested I worked in the pharmacy in town. This was a good fit for me. A short walk from school, more respectable than the other jobs being offered to my young mind, and possibly great for future university interviews. The job was okay, and I was under the strict supervision of the duty pharmacist. Let's call him... Mr. Z. Although I didn't expect much from my first job, I was pretty much stacking shelves and shouting out names for people, collecting their prescriptions, cleaning the shelves. As a result, I was bored out of my mind. You poor thing, Marty. Now, here comes a sentence which always ends badly. Here's the sentence. Keen to do something more exciting in the pharmacy. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I butted up with Mr. Z who mentioned that I could help him more in the dispensary and less in the shop side of things. It was far more fun. Even unpacking the huge medicine deliveries were more fun, looking through shelves and stacks of medicines to find their home. This all came with a cool doctor's white lab coat, making me feel very important. I think this is dangerous already. Although I'm not sure whether this is totally allowed... (laughs) Looking back now, there was also another element of the job that I liked. Learning all of the shortcuts on the very basic-looking computer system to print the labels with the medical instructions. 
I used to look at Mr. Z, who did this job effortlessly all day, tapping away on the keyboard, labels everywhere. I was much slower, but there was so much to learn. Three times a day, only take with food, do not exceed the daily dose, that kind of thing. All very important instructions, yes. though. Okay. A regular older gentleman came in, Mr. Jones, with his usual prescription for basic ailments that come with old age. I won't list them. <laughs> <laughs> in case your listeners go, yep, yep, got that one. Check. But with a one-off request for antibiotic drops for an ear infection, I rushed up to the computer and shouted, I'll, I'll do this one! To show the rest of the customers how clever I was. Mm. Actually dispensing. Handing over the prescription to Mr. Jones, I shouted because he was hard of hearing. Okay, Mr. Jones, this one is a new one. It's for your ear infection. It's to go in your right ear. The label clearly says that. It's, it says on the label, R full stop, E-A-R. It's a shortcut I knew off by heart. Days passed and Mr. Jones came into the pharmacy again saying he was in dreadful pain. His ear infection was getting worse and was very uncomfortable. He didn't want to bother the doctor, so asked me what would be best. Why have you got your hand? Uh, <laughs> you yeah. The man has, has his head in his hands. Right, so my mind has gone somewhere. Okay, cool. I advised wisely, I think, uh, that if the medicine was not working, you need to see the doctor again. This is wise advice. Yes. He smiled politely and suggested he will see him again. He also questioned the method of administration, saying it was bizarre what he had to do with the drops. <laughs> oh, no. But trusted the doctor and would continue. <laughs> again, I saw Mr. Jones, who came in very awkwardly a day later. <laughs> no. <laughs> saying he'd see the doctor and explained everything and again had another prescription for the same drops. I found this bizarre and asked why he was having the same medicine again if it wasn't working. <laughs> well, it turns out that Mr. Jones' <laughs> right ear infection was not clearing and that is because Mr. Jones was inserting the pipette <laughs> of ear oil into his bottom. <laughs> I, I, I was shocked, but didn't want to upset him, so I asked calmly why this was the case. He said it was because, on the label, it said he should be putting it into his rear. <laughs> so he continued to do so. I, and I looked... I, I realised that the R for right, full stop, on the shot was looked like it was... It said R, full stop, ear, and if you put them together and if you weren't looking very... It did indeed say that. <laughs> so my forgiveness is being sought for not correcting Mr Jones when he blamed Mr. Z, the pharmacist, and I allowed him to because I didn't want to make Mr. Jones feel embarrassed. I don't think you're going to get away with that. Mm. Anyway, surprisingly, says Marty, at the end, I'm now a fully qualified doctor <laughs> and working in London. I'm working in London. I will never use shortcuts now on the labelling, no. and despite explaining to the patient how the medicine needs to be administered, I will also tell them that they can and always should question something that they do not understand. I think about this often and feel bad to this day that Mr. Z took the blame. I'm hoping for salvation from my favourite station and the clergy. Well, he's, he's, <laughs> nice trying, he's trying to get in there. Mm, um, <laughs> I, I'm not at all sure, Marty, you're going to get away with this. Uh, sister, uh, what do you think? Because I think it's you have to take the hard line. That's what I'm expecting. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty easy one for me, right? Marty, I can't forgive you. He came in and he was in pain. We have someone in pain here and you had the opportunity to tell him, no, you, you might be getting that a little bit wrong. Maybe put it in your ear. Um, so, Marty, Well, he you're thought not he had him. said it because he put R full stop ear. So he not could have corrected him when he came back in and he let someone else take the blame. So, he did. No, That's absolutely you know. right. <laughs> A uh, brother from another guy. I mean, is it just me, or is it, it this is the system once again <laughs> crushing the man? Uh, with uh, the system being that the labels are clearly not big enough. If they're having to shorten down right ear to yes. our ear, then clearly that's a problem to do with the labeling and nothing to do with Marty. In fact, Mr. Z probably did deserve the blame for that, and Marty's learned his lesson because he's now making sure that his labels are big enough. So, Definitely forgiven. Definitely forgiven. Okay, it's a split verdict here. What do you think? It's the people's verdict. On the text, 61054. First word is Simon. Forgiveness for Marty the pharmacist. Yes or no? Meantime, 
uh, let's just catch up on the people's verdict on tonight's confession, which came from Marty and his mislabeling whilst working in the pharmacy. It was the right ear that got abbreviated, mm -hmm. rather unfortunately, for Mr. Jones with the earache. <laughs> uh, well, so here comes the people's verdict. What do we get? So hear? forgiven, says Sue in Sunderland. Best confession ever. Howling with laughter, even though I was two steps ahead. Made it even funnier. Yes. Rachel, there were so many grown-up responsible reasons for not forgiving Martin, but this was way too funny and could have been so much worse. Forgiven. Uh, not forgiven, says Brooke in Blackpool. No mercy here. I wouldn't want such a thing to happen to me. However, I deserve no mercy either for laughing my R ear off. Okay. Very that, good. That kind of works. Yeah. Uh, your confession, please. Maybe it's a pharmacy-based confession. Yeah. Maybe you're a doctor. Okay. Or a medic of some kind. Mm. Confessions, are great. <laughs> confessions are great. Confessions are great. It's radio.co.uk. If we use your confession, there you get the smart speaker. Uh, thank you very much. Another confession tomorrow. <laughs> Tonight, the latest sunset, five to eight. That's pretty good. I mean, still miserably cold and snowing. <laughs> but apart, apart from that, <laughs> uh, dancing. Okay. okay, tonight's confession. Another smart speaker. Today's goes to Woody in Newbury, not his real name. <laughs> Simon, this is a tale of audacity of youth, spatial awareness and a little nerve. It's the 1970s and I and my then wife and a close friend were on a holiday in the Lake District. We'd rented a cottage in the village of Armathwaite, which lies to the north of the lakes. Probably got that wrong. No, you've got no. it right. right. Okay. Yes, yeah. And on the eastern side of the M6, to gain access to the lakes entailed a trip down the M6 to Penrith, followed by a cross-country run on the then A66 to Keswick. My Mark I Escort would fly along the route each day, almost on autopilot, until, that is, it came to the weekend. Weekends meant excessive holiday traffic. This meant the ancient and windy A66 degenerated at best to a very slow crawl. I'd noticed there was hope for the future, but the very distant future. I could see that there was construction underway for a new dual carriageway bypass section of the A66, running almost in parallel with the existing road. Being the weekend, there was no sign of any construction activity. Temptingly close, therefore, was a long new stretch of virgin tarmac with just the odd stationary digger and dumper adorning it. Don't do it, Woody. Crawling along in this dreadful queue of traffic, I could see a small farm lane on the right-hand side, which clearly headed towards and across this new stretch of virgin tarmac. <laughs> uh, debate, 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 and then action kicked in. No oncoming traffic, so on with the indicator and a fast right turn down the farm track. Shrieks from my passengers, what the blooming heck are you doing? <laughs> Calmly replied with a brazen, trust me, trust me. The farm track dropped down into a dip over a small bridge, then up to the right, and then, if desired, continued across the newly created A66. A quick look left and right, no traffic, obviously, <laughs> and more to the point, no sign of any workman. Indicator on again as we turn left onto this empty road to traffic freedom. What could go wrong? <laughs> Bombing along, taking the racing line around stationary construction vehicles, we could see the stationary traffic going nowhere across the valley on the traditional old-fashioned A66. We were almost tempted to wave. <laughs> <laughs> so the prospect of Keswick was suddenly looking much closer and sooner than we had anticipated. Disaster then loomed in the shape of what was known in those days as a motorbike bobby, a.k.a. speed cop. Standing in the middle of our new highway to heaven, he was resting up watching the A66 traffic stream while stretching his leathers. I believe that's the expression. <laughs> yes. Not unexpectedly, he turned his head in surprise at the sound of a Mark I escort coming up behind him. Immediately his hand was in the air, with its palm directed at our approach and very clear in its demand. As we drew alongside the policeman, I wound down my window, no electric windows, and a Mark I Escort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was followed by, and here, this is the perfect thing for a policeman to say in these circumstances. <laughs> yes. Good morning, sirs and madam. Quickly followed by, could you be so kind as to tell me how you managed to be on an unopened stretch of the A66? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hmm. Well, a big fine and a stretch in porridge seemed inevitable, <laughs> but quick thinking... I breathlessly garbled. Well, we, were, we were coming across country from the north. Our map suggested we would hit the A66. On arriving at what looked like the main road, we turned right after travelling for a few minutes, realised things weren't quite right, but decided to stick with it as it was the right direction for Keswick. Uh -huh. This resulted in a somewhat sceptical, Is that so, sir? 
from the bobby, followed by, would I be correct, sir, in assuming that you won't be sticking with it in future? Uh -huh. mm. uh, yes, officer. In which case, hold it there, sir, while I stop the traffic to allow you to filter in and you can join and be on your way. Not that they speak like this in camera. <laughs> He was followed by an even more sceptical, this time on the correct A66. Which to our utter amazement he then proceeded to do. He stopped the traffic, waved us out and saluted us past. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think we got away with it. Onwards to Keswick with my heart rate slowly coming back to normal, accompanied by raucous laughter from passengers and drivers. But this is where I need to seek forgiveness, please, and apologise. Obviously... Uh, from the helpful member of the constabulary for being somewhat creative with the truth, because I wasn't exactly saying... I mean, and that's very bad. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but also deeply apologise to all the queuing motorists who'd been there for hours. Not only had we leapfrogged them, but we had rubbed salt into the wound by making them wait while we were ceremoniously filtered back into the traffic stream, fully sanctioned by a member of the constabulary. Father Simon, if looks could kill. Oh, yeah. Mm. And obviously, don't try. Oh, obviously, obviously I realised that this was a mistake, and I will never do it. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. We probably owe uh, an apology also to the government official who made the grand opening of this stretch of the new highway. <laughs> As he or she cut the ribbon, they were probably thinking they were unleashing the first private vehicle to ever grace this new section of the A66. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Little did they know that I had been there first. Anyway, uh, can I get forgiven, please? Woody, not my real name, uh, in Newbury. We've all been tempted. We've all been tempted, and we've all said no, Woody. We've just said no, but you didn't you weak person uh, <laughs> sister katie what do you say yeah woody you're not forgiven we concluded earlier in the week so matt i don't know how you're how you're going to forgive woody because okay. we concluded that q jumpers never forgiven not okay that's not true. allowed and that is exactly what you did woody in quite a dangerous fashion that's so true we have forgiven. we had another queuing uh, confession uh Brother okay Matthew. watch me wriggle into okay. a forgive here <laughs> um first thing to say is that uh, armoth Waite, lovely part of the world uh gorgeous place um the, the I, I i mean listen he saw an opportunity <laughs> didn't he saw an opportunity which let's be honest which of us could honestly say we wouldn't have done the same we'd have all done the same no well, we I'm, haven't I'm done pretty that. sure we'd have all done the same we haven't done the and same Anyway, he ended up back in the jam anyway, so no harm done. And also, he put his indicator on. Apparently, that's okay. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I put the indicator on for no one. Uh, so, yes, forgiven. He didn't tell the truth to the policeman. That's tr right. also true, but I, I like to think the policeman was uh, exercising some uh, discretion I there. That's certainly true. Uh, so, so, for that reason, I choose yeah. to forgive. Mm -hmm. Okay, people's verdict then, please. Do you forgive Woody, yes or no, on the text 61054. First word is Simon, confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk for your story. A long time ago, before the accidental stooge, we had a little confession, uh, by the way, from Woody in Newbury. His, it, it was the tale of going down the wrong piece of the A66 before it was opened, uh -huh. illegally, and then saying a couple of things that were not true uh -huh. uh, to the motorbike cop. Uh, anyway, the people's verdict is in. Here it comes. So Eileen says, not forgiven. I'm currently stuck in very slow traffic and my husband, who's driving, is getting increasingly angrier with each person that tries to push into his lane. Yes. Jog on, losers. Uh, Janet says, not forgiven. He got off lightly with a very forgiving policeman. Correct. He was clearly trying his luck. However, Mally says, forgiven. I'm assuming he, you know, stuck to the speed limit. Which he, I think he did. And he used his indicator. So, you know. No, that doesn't count. Very much ticks. And balances. So that means that you could go on an unopened stretch of road? I don't think so. Sadly not. Uh, anyway, maybe that's jogged a memory uh, in your mind. And maybe you have a confession that you'd like. But in general, as, you know, top bit of advice, if you break the law, no. it's not a good confession. But nope. I kind of think, as the policeman said, okay, on you go. Uh -huh. Then I think yes. we can say, all right, Woody, on you go. Here's yes. a smart speaker. <laughs> uh, anyway, if you have a tale for us, we would love to see it. And if we use it, you get the smart speaker. The address, confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Uh, Greatest Hits Radio, and uh, it's our last confession of the week. If you fancy a smart speaker, send us a confession. That's the trade. Uh, if we use yours, we send you a smart speaker. Uh, Brother Matthew is in the house. Sister Katie Susie is in the house. Uh, today's confession comes from Sugar Lips. Uh, that's what i got here. <laughs> Simon and team says Sugar Lips. I have something that I need to confess. This has been on my mind since the early 1990s, and I now think it's time to confess and ask for forgiveness. I moved to Birmingham from Birkenhead in 1991 after marrying a Brummie lad who I met in Blackpool in 1988. I started working 
in a department store called Rackham's, a very famous department store in the city centre. I worked in the menswear office and my friend Muffin and our manager was Chuff Chuff. <laughs> <laughs> Not real names. <laughs> okay. So it is the Thursday before Good Friday. Oh, it's a seasonal. Uh, yeah. Person. And our manager, Chuff Chuff, came to work uh, with a medium-sized chocolate buttons Easter egg for both Muffin and I. What a lovely thing for her to do, I thought. We thanked her and we put the eggs to one side. Chuff Chuff was a lovely lady. We respected her a lot. We always had a good laugh with her, but also got our work done for her. She was a great manager. So there's the context. Okay. <laughs> so around 11 a.m., Chuff Chuff went for her morning... It's very tiring now, isn't it? <laughs> went for her morning <laughs> coffee break. While she was gone, Muffin and I decided to open our Easter eggs. A little bit early, I know, but the chocolate was just there, looking at us. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was <laughs> it in the passage. Yeah. I looked at Muffin and said, we could eat the buttons, couldn't we? Wrap the eggs back up, mm. and then when Chuff gets back, open them again and tell her that the buttons are missing. We found this hilarious, and we fell about laughing at our little joke, so we proceeded. We unwrapped the eggs carefully. We ate the buttons. They were delicious. Then we wrapped the eggs up, put them back in the box, and put them on the shelf the way they'd been. I would say don't do any of this at home because it's not a good thing. <laughs> Chuff Chuff came back from her break and we were both giggling like naughty children but we just made up some excuse and, um, and Chuff believed us. About 30 minutes later I got up and picked up my egg. Chuff said oh, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that, it's not Easter. And I replied I'm only eating the buttons and I'm going to save the egg. Muffin couldn't look at me because she knew what was coming next. So I opened the egg only to discover, Father Simon, that the buttons were missing. Oh. OMG, I said. There are no, well, not that we said that back no. in the day. There are no buttons in this egg. The look of horror on Chuff Chuff's face was hard to take without laughing. She then told Muffin to open hers. And guess what? You'll never guess. <laughs> it's the same. The buttons were missing. Well, Chuff was furious. She got the telephone directory, because that's what you did. <laughs> he did, yeah. She looked for the phone number, and we can do this now, because they don't exist. Woolworths in Birmingham. Okay. okay. <laughs> and she called them. She demanded to speak to the manager. Uh, Muffin and I couldn't look at each other. It was the best bit of acting we'd ever done. Uh, the Woolworths manager comes on the phone, and Chuff proceeded to tell her, furiously, how she'd bought two Easter eggs that morning for her children. However, she'd let them open them early, only to discover that the buttons were missing. She told them how upset her two children were, as they were so looking forward to them. The manager was very, very apologetic, and then asked her for the batch number from the egg boxes, as they would need to report it to the manufacturers. Again, we just sat there carrying on with our work, not looking at each other, because we would have given the game away. Well, the Woolworths manager asked Chuff if she could go back to the shop with the eggs, and she said she couldn't, as the children had now eaten the chocolate eggs. Uh, they said, well, if you go in the next day with your receipt, that they will sort it out for. Okay, all right, so we broke up for Easter the Easter weekend, and then the following Tuesday, Chuff Chuff went to Woolworths on her way to work to see the manager. She showed them her receipt, and the manager apologised again for the disappointment that had been caused to her children. They then packed carrier bags full what? of sweets and chocolate treats, oh. emptying the shelves for her children to enjoy, and she said, I certainly hope that it hadn't ruined their Easter. Well, Chuff came into the office with these bags and gave them to me and Muffin. She was so pleased with what they'd done, but still shocked that the company would send Easter eggs out without buttons. Oh, she needs to get over herself then, really. <laughs> anyway, we enjoyed our treats for the rest of the week. Couldn't find it within ourselves to confess. Until now. I haven't uh. seen Chuff since 97, but I'm sure she's going to be listening, and she will recognise this story and know exactly who has told it. Uh. Yes. It's Sugar Lips. <laughs> <laughs> of course. There you go. Please can I ask for forgiveness for this extraordinary confession. I'm now 50 years old and it's been like a weight on my shoulder since my early 20s. Every time I eat chocolate buttons, the deceit comes rushing back. <laughs> Uh, also, I would like to say, did we add to the demise of Woolworths? We, you know, our, our bags of free confectionery, what, was it the final straw in the collapse of this high street <laughs> icon? I suspect they were. Anyway, I'm very sorry. Yours faithfully, 
uh, sugar lips. Let's see where we go. Uh, it could could have been just the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back of Woolworths, and that's why they disappeared. Sister Katie. Yeah, absolutely, and I just can't forgive that. I used to love Woolworths. They had great pick and mix there. Yeah. So Let's sugar, lips, sugar lips, you're in trouble. Um, and yeah, Chuff Dress on like, she was rather stressed and I really feel for the Woolworths manager that had to take that call because it just won't be a nice job to be the person receiving those complaints no. and you added an extra complaint to that line of calls so Sugar Lips I'm sorry you're not forgiven uh, yes okay a brother from another guy. I mean to be fair this all spiralled out of control really didn't it from Sugar Lips all she did was have the, uh, the have the chocolate buttons and I think the rules are pretty clear you are allowed to have the sweets before uh, the Bond movie on Easter Monday. It's only the egg that Is must that be right? kept. Yeah, the, oh. you can't eat the egg Who until the Bond movie on Easter Monday. Those, that's uh, that's very clear in Is the law. Is that in law. the Bible or something? It is in the Bible <laughs> okay. and the law. Right. Um, so I'm going to forgive because, you know, th- 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 no idea what was going to happen. And frankly, there were other things going on with Woolies. And so, you know, no no straw, no camel's back and, uh, and no buttons. So uh, forgiven. <laughs> okay, so basically, do you forgive Sugar Lips? That's what we'd like to know on the text. The People's Verdict 61 61- 054, you start your message with Simon. If you've got a tale of your own, confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk, maybe an Easter confession, a chocolate confession, an Easter egg confession, but the people's verdict 61054. It's drought time from Greatest Hits Radio, seven minutes past six, and the people's verdict is in on tonight's confession, which came from Sugar Lips about a great Easter egg deception. What do they say, Matt? So Bridie says, I cannot forgive. I had a Saturday job in Woolworths in Salisbury back in the 70s with its fab pick and mix and not forgetting the record counter. It was a great prank until Chuff Chuff reported it to the unsuspecting store. And their big generous heart did more than compensate. Too much, can't forgive. Sam says forgiven. The boss of Sugar Lips lied just as much as the friends by saying it was for her children. She milked the situation. She did. Exactly the same as the confessor. And Alan says all is forgiven just because that confession cracked me up. Yes! Cracked! I mean, it wasn't really worth that. Uh, Thank you very much. Anyway, if you have a confession, we would love to hear it. Maybe construct one over the weekend. Maybe it's Easter. Maybe it's chocolate. Maybe it's a whole subject that we haven't actually addressed. We'd love to hear about it. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk.